Welcome to this edition of CBN News Weekend. I'm Charlene Aaron. ISIS and other extremist groups have assaulted religious freedom in the Middle East and around the world. That's the conclusion of the newly released International Religious Freedom Report from the State Department. It documents violations by countries like Iran, Pakistan, China, and Sudan. But unlike previous years, it specifically takes aim at non-state actors, including ISIS, al-Nusra, and Boko Haram. Boko Haram alone killed more people last year than in the previous five years combined. Our primary goal is to help governments everywhere recognize that their societies will do better with religious liberty than without it. The world has learned through very hard experience that religious pluralism encourages and enables contributions from all, while religious discrimination is often the source of conflicts that endanger all. The report also cites a rise in anti-Semitism and unreasonable religious restrictions in the name of combating terrorism. Well, here in the U.S., Aaron and Melissa Klein's refusal to bake a cake for a same-sex wedding led to huge business losses and an order to pay $135,000 in damages, and they could still face more financial claims. But as Abigail Robertson reports, the Kleins believe taking a stand to protect their constitutional right to religious freedom is more important for the sake of others who may face the same fight in the future. It's been a tough few years for Aaron and Melissa Klein. They've lost their bakery, face relentless harassment, and now may see their home and wages taken if they do not pay a $135,000 fine for refusing to bake a wedding cake for a same-sex couple. Despite the hardships, the parents of five young kids plan to keep fighting. We feel very strong that, you know, we need to stand strong in this and we need, if we, if we just hand it over, then we're giving up this fight. We're giving in and we're saying, okay, you win. And we're not standing up for the next person. That's why the couple won't set a national precedent for future religious liberty cases by just handing over the money. Aaron says that the irony in their case is that the same-sex couple who were returning customers to the bakery have publicly said they don't want the money, this is not about the money, and that the only person who wants to see the $135,000 fine change hands is the Oregon Labor Commissioner. Even though the case is under appeal, Aaron and Melissa have been ordered to pay the fine. The state has not yet seized the couple's accounts or enforced any property liens, but that could change any day. Even if that day comes, the clients will not give up their fight to protect the religious liberty of all Americans. I constantly think about the next person in line that this is going to happen to. And if we don't stand up for them, you know, what's going to happen? And we're going to continue to stand firm and fight this. And um, like Melissa said, we're, we're not going to set precedence by just giving the money and then uh, hoping that uh, we get it back if we went on appeal. Aaron and Melissa are asking for prayers for their family, their marriage, and most importantly, that God would soften the hearts of all government officials involved in their case, in cases like theirs, that they may finally see an end to this ongoing going ordeal. Reporting from Washington, Abigail Robertson, CBN News. Well, we live in a new and frightening era when many religious believers are being told doing their jobs takes priority, priority over their conscience. Paul Strand shows us how this could pose big problems for the faithful. One thing Kentucky clerk Kim Davis has heard over and over during her refusal to issue gay marriage licenses is just do your job. Religious Liberties lawyer Matt Bowman says that's part of a strategy by progressives to redefine jobs in order to support their agenda. The left is not content that abortion or same-sex weddings or assisted suicide even be legal. They want to force you to help. And if you won't help, you won't be able to earn a living for your family because your job has now been redefined to include these things. In this Federalist article, Bowman points out how the government forces many employers to cover costs for abortion-causing contraceptives. Vermont requires doctors to tell some patients they can assist them in committing suicide. This is a serious problem because a lot of patients don't want to go to a doctor who considers it a legitimate option to kill them. Christian clerks, bakers, and florists have paid the legal price for not doing their jobs as the politically correct deemed necessary. These are all situations where the government 
is has is become weaponized on the movement of abortion and suicide and gay marriage to force people to coerce them to punish them to take away their licenses to tell them they can't be in business to tell them uh, maybe even to send them to jail you know there's a lot at stake here davis went to jail rather than issue same-sex marriage licenses in her name because she sees it as a spiritual struggle for the soul of the nation this is not a a, a war um with flesh and blood it's, it's a war of principalities. It's, it's a spiritual warfare. They never were really interested in the licenses in the first place. They're interested in Kim Davis's scalp on a wall. Davis's attorney, Matt Staver, points out these legal crackdowns are really about forcing submission. Even though there's other alternatives out there, there's other bakers, there's other florists, they want the person who has the deeply held religious conviction to participate in a ceremony that celebrates something that is contrary to God's word. Family law professor Robin Fretwell Wilson thinks religious believers who refuse to compromise will continue to lose in the courts. Meeting CBN News at the National Constitution Center, she used Davis as an example. No person can be the choke point on the path to marriage and deny other people their rights. What Fretwell Wilson argues is that if people of faith want their religious rights respected, those on the other side are gonna have to feel their rights are respected too. She praises a compromise in Utah where Mormons and LGBT groups sat down together to advance all their rights. That project of advancing their rights gives us an opportunity to sit down as a community and say, how can we live together in peace? How can we have more elbow room in a state that feels like it's crushing in on us? And crushing is exactly what's happening to Washington florist Baronel Studsman, who said no to furnishing the flowers for a gay wedding. A legal defeat will cost her everything. A retirement our home and our business, because they're also suing us personally and corporately. So uh, we'll possibly lose everything we own. This is the government basically trying to bully Baronel to set an example, to say if you don't tow this ideological line, you and your family will be coerced, you'll be punished, you'll be put out of business. Stutzman wishes her opponents could see her stand isn't personal. Christ said it, I didn't. So, you know, you're, you're fighting the wrong person here. Another reason why Staver doesn't want government to force Kim Davis out. It sets a precedent. If you're a Christian mm -hmm. and you believe in marriage that people have believed in through millennia of human history that Jesus himself spoke about, then you ought to not run for office. If you're in office, you ought to resign. And the bullying won't stop there. We already saw what happened with the baker and the florist and the wedding photographer, and it's going to happen to churches and to Christian colleges. Navy Chaplain Wes Motter faced a forced discharge for counseling military members about the Bible's stance on homosexuality and premarital sex. I think comfortable Christianity is over. I think that we need to come to a point not looking to fight, but there's going to come a moment where every believer who is a follower of Jesus Christ has to make a decision. Will you choose me or will you choose the world? Modder's attorney calls these dangerous times for believers. People in this country who are really paying attention and seeing that are going to be outraged and shocked when they, when they learn that this is coming to their door too. It's not just in the big cities or in the, uh, you know, on the East Coast or the West Coast. Fretwell Wilson has a warning. Religious people and religious groups have to be observant right now. They have to be cognizant of the things that are changing in our lives. What we're seeing happen to Bear now uh, could happen to a lot of other people if we continue to allow this, this uh, trajectory to continue. What many people of faith are realizing is this is a whole new era, uncharted territory, and many things that they took for granted and rights that they felt were guaranteed are way up in the air. Paul Strand, CBN News, reporting from the National Constitution Center, Philadelphia. And joining us now with more is Paul Strand from our bureau in Washington, D.C. Paul, is it really getting as threatening for believers as your story seems to suggest? Are all of us going to be challenged at our jobs? Well, Charlene, I know it seems that maybe this is an exaggeration, but that is one thing. Uh, the, the attorney, Michael Berry, who represented Chaplain Motter, he says this is going to come to every small town, every rural community in America. That, in other words, uh, the folks on the other side of this issue, they're very serious. They want 100 percent compliance. So it does seem that way. And I've got some uh, another story I was just working on. I got some interesting number, uh, numbers. The Liberty Institute compiles this yearly report on numbers of uh, religious hostility cases in America. Mm. Two years ago, they found 1,600 in America. 
And since then, just in these last two years, that number has gone up 133% of religious hostility cases in the country. Wow. And also Liberty Institute itself, which represents um, clients who need help in this area, they say that uh, since the Supreme Court Obergefell versus Hodges uh, same-sex marriage ruling came out, that the calls to their office for help have gone up 400%. That's 400% in just a few months. So you can tell how serious it is. And in fact, uh, the Liberty Institute so many people are calling them on from so many different areas of life. They put out all these little booklets, a religious liberty protection kit for the U.S. military, for ministries, wow. for Christian schools, for churches, and for students and teachers. So that's, they're getting that array of people calling them from all over the place wow. asking for help. Amazing, amazing. Well, in your piece, Professor Fretwell Wilson was suggesting that there is a way through all this that respects all sides. Have you seen any examples of this? Um, I, well, she talks about this Utah compromise where um, pretty much the Mormons in power sat down with the LGBT groups and they all were saying, you know, well, I guess what the Mormons were saying to the, um, the gays and lesbians was, how, how would you feel comfortable? How, how would you like to see your rights protected? And it gave, them, uh, it gave them a chance, an opening for both sides to sit down and to try to figure out what to do and how to live with this. And I think that's the interesting thing for us Christians is right now it just seems like the automatic answer in these cases is to stand up and fight and mm. to, uh, you know, for the Lord's sake, defy. But what Fred well, Wilson is saying is, um, you know, in this new landscape, the new laws, these people, the gays and the lesbians and all, they have to be served. Uh, that's the law. In other words, this isn't going to go away. Just because we stand up and defy it doesn't mean that it's going to stop and we can just walk away. Um, so what she's saying is um, we're going to have to learn how to compromise. Mm. And the way that she's looking at it is how can you most be kind to the other side? What's the kindest thing to do? And I guess her feeling is that if we all try to do that, like in other words, as you look at the individual gay couple that's coming up to be married at the, uh, at the registrar's office, how do you best treat them as human beings? And so maybe that's a way for us Christians to start to think about this issue. In other words, when a couple comes to you, could, could you bake the, uh, the cake for our wedding? I don't know, you know, maybe say, sure, I'll do it. I, I might even do it for free if you'll just let me talk to you about awesome. Jesus. Will you give me 20 minutes? That's an Something opportunity. Something like that, maybe. Turning them into opportunities. Paul Strand, yeah. thank you so much for your time. And you can follow Paul on Twitter, as well as Facebook, as well as our website, cbnnews.com. Married people with children generally do better financially than other Americans. That's according to data released by the Census Bureau. The overall median household income last year was a little over $53,000. But married couples with children had a median income of almost $88,000. Why do Americans who maintain traditional families generally do so well compared to other Americans? Terry Jeffrey from CNS.com shared his thoughts with us. These married couple families with kids that are making generally more money than the rest of Americans are not driven by greed, but they're driven by love. And I think if you, if you look at it, it, it specifically, mo mothers and fathers that stay together in a traditional family are dedicated. They love their children. They're dedicated to raising their children the right way, to maintaining their family. So they're sta sometimes they're staying in jobs they don't like. They're working harder than they would maybe otherwise because they want to provide housing. They want to provide food. They want to provide an education to their spouse and to their children and make sure the next generation is at least as well off as they are. So I think they have an incentive, ironically, it's not the pursuit of money that causes them to end up in the end having more money. It's the pursuit of doing right by their family and living up to their responsibilities. And you can watch the rest of that interview on our website, cbnnews.com. Coming up, this Atlanta fire chief was fired for his faith. Now he's fighting back his story when we return. So, where can you go to find encouragement, be a part of a prayer community, grow in your faith, watch inspiring videos, and win prizes for free? The MyCBN app, a great place to belong. Download the app at cbn.com slash mobile. Grow, connect, have fun. The MyCBN app.
It's a case of being fired for faith. Wednesday marked the start of former Atlanta Fire Chief Kelvin Cochran's first hearing in his wrongful termination lawsuit against the city. Chief Cochran was fired after 34 years of service after he wrote a Bible study book that disagrees with the city's policies. Abigail Robertson has more. Once one of the highest ranked fire officials in the country, former Atlanta Fire Chief Kelvin Cochran has now seen his career ripped away from him for expressing his religious views in a Bible study book. This faith and patriotism that caused me to be a firefighter in the first place. Chief Cochran dedicated 34 years of his life to serving in the public fire department and was appointed Atlanta Fire Chief in 2008. But last November, he was abruptly terminated from his dream job after a complaint to a gay city councilman. The councilman then went to Atlanta Mayor Kasim Reed. The complaint involved a passage in the book about biblical views of sex, including statements against homosexuality, using terms like perversion, inappropriate, and unclean. The complaint called that passage offensive. For that faith, uh, to lead to all the career successes that I've had to ultimately conclude or end my career by expressing it in a book uh, is just unthinkable in the United States of America. Cochran asked permission from the Atlanta Ethics Department before writing the faith-based book, and he only distributed it to co-workers who had already established a relationship with as believers. He even gave a copy to Mayor Reed, who congratulated him on writing it and promised to read it. Cochran was shocked to learn his book would be offensive to anybody. It was such a shock to everyone uh, that it would occur and it would be so abrupt. There was a lot of just heartache and heartbreak and tears. The city launched an investigation to find out if coworkers felt Chief Cochran had created a discriminatory environment, including possible discrimination against gays. The investigation found that he hadn't, but Mayor Reed fired Chief Cochran, claiming he would not tolerate discrimination of any kind in his administration. In February of this year, Chief Cochran filed a lawsuit against the city of Atlanta, saying he had been wrongfully fired. Kelvin Cochran is fighting to prove Americans should not have to live in fear of being terminated from their jobs because of their religious beliefs. David Cortman, one of the lawyers defending Chief Cochran, says this is not just a fight about vindicating the chief, but rather a fight to protect every American's right to freedom of speech. The reason this case is so important to everyone is we have the federal government telling someone, if you don't agree with their views, with their orthodoxy, you are not fit to hold a position. You are not fit to make a living. That should worry everyone. Chief Cochran says his former co-workers are afraid to express their support or reactions because of fear of the potential consequences. They can't say, I believe, like Chief Cochran believes, for fear that they will be terminated as well. No American should have to choose between living out their faith and keeping their job. Since his termination, faith communities in the Atlanta area and around the country have given the Cochran family a tremendous outpouring of love and support. He asked for continued prayer for the mayor and the city, as well as for strength for his wife and children. I've never felt that I was in this all by myself, not for a moment. Chief Cochran stays positive by believing that all suffering is for the glory of God and that he would not be going through this had God not prepared him for it. Reporting from Atlanta, Abigail Robertson, CBN News. Up next, investigations into Planned Parenthood have caused the abortion giant to backtrack. That story when we come back. Introducing the CBN Bible from CBN.com. Now, an easier way to study the Bible and grow in your faith. I like your favorite verse. Read separate versions at a glance. Click and read a commentary or cross-reference your favorite verse using the Strong's Concordance. All the right tools to study the Bible, all in one place. The CBN Bible, available at cbn.com Bible or the iTunes App Store. Republicans are pushing to remove a sculpture of Planned Parenthood's founder from the Smithsonian. Presidential candidate Ted Cruz and Congressman Louis Gohmert are leading 26 Republicans who called the bust of Margaret Sanger an outrage. They've issued a letter calling for it to be immediately removed from the National Portrait Gallery's Struggle for Justice exhibit. The letter noted 
that Ms. Sanger was an avowed advocate of eugenics and the extermination of groups that she deemed, of people that she deemed as undesirables. This follows a request sent to the museum by a group of black pastors this past August. Well, Planned Parenthood has, has launched a new effort at damage control, announcing that it will no longer accept cash for fetal tissue donations. But the abortion giant will continue to harvest fetal tissue for research. The man behind the undercover videos that expose the gruesome practice says the policy change is an admission of guilt. As Caitlin Burke reports, this latest shift comes as scrutiny continues to mount. It's Planned Parenthood's latest attempt at damage control. The group's president writing a letter Tuesday to the U.S. director of the National Institute of Health, announcing Planned Parenthood will no longer accept money for fetal tissue donations. Adding, quote, Planned Parenthood's policies on fetal tissue donation already exceed the legal requirements. Now we're going even further in order to take away any basis for attacking Planned Parenthood to advance an anti-abortion political agenda. This letter comes after Planned Parenthood's practice of selling baby body parts was thrust into the spotlight through a series of undercover videos from the Center for Medical Progress. Republicans have launched several investigations into Planned Parenthood, along with an effort to cut off the organization's federal funding. Kristen Hawkins from Students for Life says Planned Parenthood has been exposed. Now it's up to the American public to pull its support. Planned Parenthood wants us to use this so they can say, oh, well, we took care of that. And really the question for that we're asking on college campuses is if your health care provider just admitting that it's no longer going to sell the parts of aborted babies, do you trust them on anything else? Planned Parenthood says its fetal tissue program currently takes place in two states, California and Washington. The Washington state affiliate already has a policy of accepting no reimbursement. The remaining clinics will now be following suit. Caitlin Burke, CBN News. But those who hope in the Lord will renew their strength. They will soar on wings like eagles. They will run and not grow weary. They will walk and not faint. That is our CBN Good News verse of the week from Isaiah 40, verse 31. Do you want to have the endurance that comes only from God? Hope in the Lord and His Word says that you will be like the eagles who soar. So find your confidence in Him and you will be uplifted. Well, that's all for this hour of CBN News Weekend. And you can find more of our exclusive coverage of the issues you care most about at CBNNews.com and stay up to date with CBN News through Facebook and Twitter. We hope you'll join us next time. Have a wonderful weekend and God bless.